This episode features a discussion with Jesse David Fox, senior editor at Vulture and host of the fascinating Good One podcast, where he talks to comedians about their jokes and attempts to dig into how funny people think and then communicate what they think to the public. We talk about his divisive theory of post-comedy and forms of humor that don't seem to fit the mold, uh, how the rhythm of comedy has changed in the context of our coronavirus-induced isolation, how the notion of booms and busts in comedy doesn't really match up with the historical fact that, as he puts it, comedy is a renewable resource. I've been a comedy nerd for quite a while, so it was really fun to pick Jesse's brain for a bit and to talk about the book project he has planned, a study of how comedy has transformed and is constantly reshaping itself in response to specific events. Uh, I want to start, you know, I love um, the name you've given yourself on Twitter. Like, I think Jesse David Fox Battle Angel is an incredible joke that I hope you never change. Sure. Um, and I, I thought about just making this whole interview just about that one joke mm-hmm. in the way the good one is just about one joke. Um, but uh, I have too many things that I want to ask. You. Sure. Yeah. And I don't know how much I have to say about I can't remember <laughs> if I did it before or after I saw the movie. It must have been after because I always thought it was a funny <laughs> subtitle, but I thought it was I thought the movie ruled. And it's pretty great. And I um, then tweeted about it. And then if you tweet about it, there's like a battle angel sort of Twitter army that asks <laughs> you if you want to be a member or whatever. <laughs> um, and I, I just thought it was such a funny juxtaposition of words. Um, it really is. I also love subtitles, um, mm. like colon, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think they're great. I wish I could change the title my hope was like, oh, if, if people realize I'm into subtitles, I can like keep on changing it. And then it could be like Jesse David Fox, a Star Wars story <laughs> or Jesse David Fox, um, whatever that uh, insane John Wick movie was. But people started to get. Yeah. yeah. So but um, I don't think people got it. So I was like, I'll just keep mm-hmm. it as Battle Angel. And I sort of moved on. I wonder to what extent, like the the first question I want to ask you is about your kind of academic background. And I wonder, you know, there's this weird habit in academic uh, mm-hmm. literature of using the colon as this like ritual thing. Like you always just have to do this kind of pre and post colon structure to your titles. Yeah. Um, and it is kind of inherently hilarious. Like there's yes. always the kind of fun title before the colon and then like just what the paper is about afterward. Um so I think that's maybe, you know, wor- worthy of parody in and of itself. Yeah, well, it's just such a serious thing to do, to feel yeah. like I titled it, but you need, like, I need to explain. It just sort of, it's a, it's an unnecessary thing if you've done the job you wanted to do in the first part, but, like, it's also a thing you're doing because um, you feel like there's people who aren't going to get it and you want to, like, <laughs> put on airs or, like, try to reach people who are going to be confused, right? If you just name that movie Alita, right, the people who are like, mm. Oh, I don't know what that is. Forget it. It's like, oh, Battle Angel, that's words. But I mean, like, and so mm-hmm. I think it's a bit of that. Or it's the like it, you see it so much in book titles. It'd be like the divide, and it's like colon. It's like how the right wing in America turned into a something, 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 and how the left wing turned into a something, something, something else. And you're yeah. like, What? That's, that's not a title of a book. <laughs> yeah. You that's just a full you paragraph. Want be, you're essentially just being like someone who's walking around a bookstore they'll be able to be like, got it. That's what this book is. That's what's I'll going look. on. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, so, you know, one of the things uh, you've noted on your podcast, good one, uh, which I'm a huge fan of is Thank that you. it's actually very weird to be interviewed. Mm, uh, yes. so I thought, I thought I'd start by saying that I just totally agree. Like doing <laughs> this podcast has definitely been a, a learning experience in the sense that you have to really think around the awkwardness of the interview format yeah. and, and figure out ways to make it seem natural. Yeah. Um, and you have this background in psychology. Uh, uh, and I, I wonder to what extent you think your academic training is part of the reason maybe that you try to capture that experience of hearing funny people think, is it, you know, ha- have, have you left that in, in, you know, your kind of background as it were? Yeah. I don't, I didn't leave college being like, I have a lot of specific knowledge that I'm going to apply to the world. I mean, I learned a lot about psychology, I guess. I got good enough grades in it. My interest in thinking and in thought, you know, predates co- college in so much as that that's why I decided that I wanted to major in it. And then I, through college, 
that interest was um, rewarding or I found it continued to be interesting. Like, I, I think there's possibly that it's, it's a thing of, it's to use what they say often with comedy. It's like you cut up the dead frog and you're like, Oh, I'm not interested in frogs anymore. But like the more I learned about psychology, I was continued to continually interested in it, but I, there was sort of no career that I thought in psychology I, I would want to do. And so then once I started interviewing people, it was the thing that I was most curious about, which is a sort of like how your brain, what gets to your brain to go from X to B or X to Y or X to Z or I guess, and then it was a matter of trying to create a format in which I can do that. Um, and because unlike your therapist, this is, you know, I think that's the other part of it, which is like a lot of it just comes from going to therapy and finding to be an interesting process. And, you know, my dad's therapist and through him, I think I found it to be an interesting process. Um, but the difference is like, you're, if you're being interviewed, that person is not your therapist. They don't know you. Um, they haven't been seeing you for years so there it's legitimate to be like it's kind of weird this person is asking me questions about this thing that I would only talk to my therapist about Mm -hmm. but I I found the for people who are good people who are you know have a soul have the soul of an artist as I sometimes will call them their work is very personal to them even if it doesn't seem that personal in how a lot of people define personal art, right? Like, even if it's not that autobiographical, the work can be very personal to them. And and they want that part of themselves to be seen and heard. So that I found was an entryway to have that conversations about who these people are as thinkers or who they are in their minds. Um, that was sort of the difficulty. I mean, like, so I don't know if... I was trained because I, I wasn't really trained to do anything in college. It was more just learning about it. You know, if I went to, if I got a master's or whatever, I probably would have some sort of analytic training. Um, it's more just sort of like, I've had a lifelong interest in the way in which people think. Right. Um, I have I have a lot of questions about the kind of trajectory of the show. Like you've talked about this a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that, At first, it it felt like there was a little bit of resistance. The comedians didn't want to seem self-serious. They they would often just kind of deflect. Um, And that's no longer really the case. Um, And you've kind of suggested that this is partly about just like building trust and building a kind of almost like equity, as it were, like a Mm -hmm. a reputation for like asking thoughtful questions and so on. Um, But I wonder also to what extent you feel like Um, like in excess of that, like personal trust that you've developed, there has also been a cultural shift in maybe public attitudes toward comedy. Like the tone of comedy has certainly become more serious, like, especially with the rise of feminist comics, I would say like, you know, Hannah Gatsby, Jenny Jenny Slate. Um, Is it the case because, you know, like analysis of comedy is, is known to be like a very fraught thing. The, Mm -hmm. The philosopher Simon Critchley starts his book on humor by talking about how analyzing a joke just kills it. And you've yes. even ag- acknowledged that explaining a joke fails to really capture the magic of a person. Um, so it's like this interesting kind of balancing act where you seem, you know, sometimes you you say you're nervous that comedians will just straight up disagree with your analysis <laughs> or be like outraged that you're, you're digging so deeply, you know, do you feel like there are guests who are more resistant to analysis? Do you try and match the tone or level of analysis in your questions to the comedians that you're talking to? Or is everyone who appears on your show there really because they are open to analysis? Sure. Um, what was the name of that, that philosopher you said? Simon Critchley. Great. There's a lot of stuff there. I will say that th- the first part of the idea, which is, has there been a cultural shift in attitudes about doing this, uh, analyzing comedy broadly? Um, I, I wanted to write down that person's name because like, I'm currently like, working on a book proposal and that's like a large portion of it is this Mm. sort of like shift. And I think it's, you know, I think I don't, there's a variety of reasons why, but it it definitely was a bigger shift over the last five years as I've been sort of, I've been writing about comedy in different capacities for let's say eight or nine years or maybe 10 years. I can't remember, but five years I've really been diving into jokes like this. And, um, and the amount of people who are 
who push back about it are um, or much fewer than the people who are fine with it. Um, and I, so, and you, and so, yeah, there's been cultural attitudes that have shifted, and I, I don't think necessarily it, it's it's hard because it's like I don't think like Hannah Gatsby like changed it or you know as much as like Hannah Gatsby was able to exist because society is ready for a person to do that, and um, there were comedy that you know there's comedies of different capacities that sort of did similar things like um i think of like what louis the tv show did was like a really big thing of but also i think honestly i mean it's like it's 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 hard frustrating to give louis so much credit but like louis just sort of became the first comedian people were allowed to write about in um magazines and newspapers that and saying like how smart and interesting and whatever he is and I think that sort of like paved a way to do that for a lot of different comedians um and and because that so that happening you have comedians of a younger generation um seeing that at a fairly young age and she being taken serious, be somewhat normalized. I also think sort of comedians under, let's say, the age of, I want to say 45. Let's say the under age of 45, because I think like Dave Chappelle's like 46, but under the age of 45, you know, they came up in a time where a lot of the comedy they were consuming was like post the comedy club boom. So like they grew up watching Comedy Central. They grew up wanting to be a comedian. You know, it just sort of was... And then, you know, they're supposed to John Stewart. So, like, the idea that, like, this thing that they've dedicated their life to can be talked about is much, makes much more sense to them because it, it it's much more like a career pursuit like people who go into whatever career opposed to, like, something you fall into. There are people who are fans and it's undeniable. Um, people, you know, like, I interviewed Jerry Seinfeld whatever it was like five years ago and he was sort of resistant to the idea of analyzing jokes mm -hmm. and now he released a he's releasing a book that's just all of his jokes written out like they're poems like he clearly understands that something has changed um mm -hmm. and so the other part of your question which was how do i adjust the fact of people's willingness to be analyzed or not analyzed i mean i will say by preparing most of my preparation is listening to podcasts of uh, the other person i sometimes read interviews as well if there's information that i need um but very often i can just skim those they're not really that necessary you don't really get a sense of a person from a written short written interview um with audio interviews you're able to get a sense of what they're like when they are interviewed and how um open they are or how closed off they are right so it's like mm -hmm. you know jenny slate I like when I was going to the Jenny Slane interview, I was like, this is going to, going to be a challenge because in every interview she ever does, no matter the quality of the interview, she is just so open as like a career goal, as an artistic um, drive. Openness is like the most important thing to her. Vulnerability to, to an extreme is like her life's goal. So like, for me, I'm like, well, how do I do this in any way that seems that will be different for her or interesting or just sort of capture a different part of her? Um, but like, and ultimately, I actually sort of went back to like what the premise of the show is, which is like, ultimately, a lot of people ask her very personal questions, but they don't ask her that much about her work. Um, and so which I sort is, of thought, which is weird. Yeah, I think it's just the nature of it. Like when people are open and so like, lovely to talk about about like just sort of the struggles of being a human being they sort mm -hmm. of are performing in interviews in a way and so that's so captivating so you sort of just want to ask her about like i don't begrudge those people like i think it totally no, makes sense yeah. but her appearance on the new yorker podcast she talks about fashion and it's yeah. riveting yeah. yeah yeah i mean she's just so good at it and i there's there are certain people who become famous that i think of them as stand-ups and i want to either share that part of them to the world that like hey this person is a stand-up comedian they gave gave a lot of time to this and share that with them because i think jenny maybe doesn't feel as respected as other stand-ups and i think it's partly because she approaches it the way she does and so i just wanted to have a conversation about that but there's other comedians and comedians 
some are very controlling as people or they they have certain control issues and they, and they're not willing to be vulnerable and you sort of account for that and you try to ask questions in a way and you know this is where the writing part of it comes in trying to ask questions where your like emotional intelligence is like turned the most on and being like I want him to talk about this or her to talk about this but I I know if I put these are going to be words that are triggering in ways that they'll make it make it seem like I'm trying to get them or something so I want to make sure I can pull it off in a way where it's clear that I'm on their side, that I'm working for them essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a dance, but it's a thing that I'm very cognizant of for every single person. I'm like, how do they like to talk about themselves? How do they treat other people? And some people are harder than others. You know, some people are just sort of like prone to steamrolling and there's almost nothing you can do. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is some older people are not used to this idea, right? Like when I talk to Gilbert Gottfried, he's like not prone to like analyzing himself this way. And he's so closed off. But then I was like, okay, well, then I'm just going to have fun and try to capture certain things. I'm going to talk and have him respond to it. I'm going to put things to him and, you know, I'm going to capture who what he's like by displaying it opposed to having him say it. Hmm. And, and yet, like, the joke that you're analyzing is seen as, the aristocrat's joke is seen as emblematic of boundary-pushing comedy. So it's interesting that he'd be resistant to talking about it. Um, you also mentioned that it's kind of frustrating, at the beginning of your answer, you mentioned it's frustrating to credit Louis C.K. Mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons. But the thing that it, it, we feel compelled to acknowledge is the fact that C.K. put more difficult subject matter on the table in a way, when it came to comedy. Um, but he did it, I think, in retrospect, in such an aggressive way mm -hmm. that there's been, you know, even before uh, he was canceled, there was a, a, a kind of backlash brewing, I think. And Hannah Gatsby and Nanette kind of captured it perfectly. I think when she's talking about, you know, white male rage and comedy, she's pretty explicitly talking about CK, maybe also Bill Burr and, and others. But I, yeah. I think if I had a guess, I think she's talking about Jim Jeffries. Um, oh, really? Interesting. Because he's a, I, um, I honestly can't remember if she said that to me. There, mm. I, I prepared so much and she's a very interesting interview. But she was saying that she went to a show. She went to see Jim Jeffries. And he was oh, talking okay. about either sort of something about lesbians or something about rape. I can't remember. And she and Hannah found herself laughing. And then she realized there is something powerful that you can do with when you're in a crowd with laughing that is actually um very toxic mm -hmm. and there's a certain sort of comedian who um ignores that power and thinks that okay if they're laughing it's okay right. um there's other comedians she's talking about i'm sure but like he's probably the most famous example i don't know about her relationship to bill burr like because she's in a, she's not american i don't know how how aware she would be of him and then louis by the time we saw it, Louis was a bigger deal because Louis had already had the news come out. Um, mm -hmm. But you're in the middle of a question. Sorry. Oh, no, it's all good. Um, you know, I think, you know, what I'm what I'm kind of after, again, is the the kind of it seems like we're at a turning point, right? Like um, uh, comedy franchises as big as The Simpsons are being taken to task for their reproduction of stereotypes in ways that they never were. Right. Like that was a show that changed comedy for people of my generation. Mm -hmm, it was yeah. this countercultural ant ant antidote and it was like untouchable. Um, and yet, you know, now fans are kind of forced to take a side on the Simpsons because of Hari Kondabolu's criticism of the show with his problem, the problem with that poo documentary. Um, it just seems clear today that there's a sense that comedy matters politically uh, and that it can and should be a venue for like dealing with difficult stuff. You've got Kurt Braunahler talking about police brutality, Aziz Ansari talking about animal cruelty, Killer Mike uh, with his Netflix show Trigger Warning, literally telling kids there are no jobs in America and it's bad to follow your dreams. Or sure. Sasha Baron Cohen tricking Dick Cheney into signing a waterboarding kit. And so now like you're getting difficult subjects like racism, sexism, even sexual harassment. Um, you're, you're seeing them made bearable by comedy. And that I just wonder if you think that it, it we are at kind of a a decisive turning point where you know that that magic of comedy that we've all always sort of you know perceived the ability to 
Trojan horse, difficult ideas through humor um, is is being kind of realized. And who who I suppose do you think best embodies that today? Sure, said a lot of things that I'm trying to respond to. I mean, I do think. And also, I suppose, is there a right and wrong way to do it? Like, no, there's no right and wrong way to do it. Everything okay. is, you're an artist, you can do it however you do it. I mean, I don't think people are forced to pick sides mm. as much as it seems, at least for The Sim- Simpsons, in so much as people still watch The Simpsons and have a frustrations with Apu. I think the sort of legacy of The Simpsons is not being questioned um, writ large. I have not seen like a massive turn to be like the simpsons was actively bad otherwise um Mm -hmm. and i also don't even think i even you know i think the the poo thing was more complicated because it's like hari loved the show that thing is was hard for a lot of people growing up that that writer's room did not account for i think that writer's room to themselves was iteratively a step forward in in many ways because of how much um, integrity ga- they gave that character. However, comedy does not age like that. Just because you did something at the time that was like better than what came before it does not mean um, it's good for forever. That is what's interesting about comedy. Comedy reacts to the time it's in. Mm-hmm. It's weird for a show to be on across multiple generations, right? That show was created by sort of I mean, it's hard to say. I think a lot of those people are actually baby boomers by age. But like, you know, it's like this Gen X irreverent show, right? And we live in a more reverent time, and that's fine. Um, and it has adjusted otherwise. You know, they they fired their musical director because they realized they needed someone to write better rap songs. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, like, that's allegedly, it's complicated. I should not comment on that. It's like a court case. But anyway, so... Hmm what you're talking about has existed in comedy for I don't know if I would say forever I'm trying to think I my knowledge of let's say comedy before 1970s not or not before 1960s not so good that I can say for forever but like Lenny Bruce existed right and Dick Gregory yeah, yeah. Lenny Bruce then Dick Gregory then you know Richard Pryor George Carlin right and mm-hmm. um Mort Saul, right? So like all these people are doing political related things and they were rewarded for it. And not only were they rewarded for it, it was the comedy that was most rewarded, um, mm-hmm. sort of like culturally. I think it is because, as I say, like people don't know how to take comedy seriously as an art form other than if it is being political um, because, well, like, oh, well, politics is serious. That means this comedy is serious. That means it's good. Well, there's a lot of serious comedians are, there's a lot of comedians who talk about serious subject matters who aren't very good because their sort of craft isn't there. And subject matter is not the definition of like what quote unquote good is, at least to me. It is to maybe other people. People have their own value systems. Mine is not necessarily that. Um, I do think from 1990 on, you, you, you've you seen comedy being taken more seriously in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of it was Seinfeld being on and it's a show about a comedian's life. And that made it seem like the job of a comedian was something you should care about. Um, I think Comedy Central existing and being a network that is like only about comedy is a generational shift. I think Def Jam and having a show like Comic View on every night. I think like the prominence of Janine Garofalo there was that era of SNL that came in the late nineties and then early two thousands that was sort of female dominated. There's sort of all these things that sort of touch all these different communities that made like comedy keep on moving forward. Then you sort of had this sort of John Stewart move, which at least I'm talking about the United States. I have no idea in other places, but you know, John Stewart got so much praise because, you know, people are getting the news from him or, and that made comedy seem serious. I think that was a huge thing. Um, But I think, and then I think the really turning point for me to get to your question of where the turning point was, was there's two, which was 2008 um, in the Obama-McCain election and Tina Fey's impression of Sarah Palin is given a good amount of credit for John McCain losing. I think more credit than it deserves, but it has pr- it, that showed like, oh, wow, comedy can really change things and can do something. So yeah. 
that has made it so like there was a lot of people who put a lot of stake in comedy. So then you have eight years later and Trump gets elected and comedy is now part of the sort of tools in which people like put energy to sort of fight back on things. So I don't think that I, I've written about about a lot of the jokes about Trump have not been good. And I think that's true. But mm. I do think comedy in general, you know, Trump getting elected made a lot of people take what they do more seriously and and res- and want more out of themselves. And I think you're seeing work that reflects that, which is a lot of comedians who are like, I need to do something. And if, if I'm just going to be funny, and I'm not going to push back upon anything, then I should do that for a reason. Like, um, it's similar to, I think, I've talked to comedians after 9-11 and they're like, oh, I need to like do something. If I'm going to like, if this is my life and they're, and so I think there's a bit of that, which is like, you know, Trump was elected and our our jobs are as important as anything else. We're public figures. We're seen as public figures. We have an opportunity here and we have an audience who has is patient enough to hear us talk about different subjects. Um, I, 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 to me, like Louis is not a tremendous influence on the subject matter in which people talk. I, I think Louis' stand up at least was very like it wasn't I, I I delineate between sort of honest and confessional and I thought it was confessional in so much as he would talk about things and he'd want op, um, absolution and he wanted to be forgiven for doing bad things or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But it was just sort of like it was very grotesque. Like I didn't find it like particularly personal. I just found it like really like focusing on the sort of grotesqueness of human existence. But I, I do think um, the show did a lot tonally in terms of like what still counts as comedy. And also its success is probably the biggest difference, which is like, it's so successful that the industry allows things like it to exist. And those things are successful. So the industry is like, oh, we should allow more things like that to exist. You know, people have been doing different types of stand-up for a very long time with different amounts of jokes, blah, blah, blah. But it is noteworthy that the market wants it. And it's noteworthy that the industry is responding to that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, so much I want to talk about coming out of that answer. And, you know, you've also talked to Roy Wood Jr. about how comedy changed after 9-11 and how it's fundamentally different after a pandemic, right? Like these disruptive events cause comics to sort of meet the moment in a variety of different ways. And, I, you know, coming out of your what you just said, I think, you know, what, what you're suggesting is that like comedians feel a certain responsibility to experiment in reaction to these kinds of events. And I think you've talked about how you have a certain bias for more experimental comedy and how you've had to become more open to types of comedy that are like maybe more generic and thus kind of not instinctively your favorite kind of comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in, in discussing Chappelle's eight minutes and 46 seconds and Hannah Gatsby's Douglas specials, you underline the fact that there's um, a kind of reckoning uh, within what counts as comedy um, kind of pushing, you know, experimenting with those generic boundaries. Um, Douglas is like totally explicit about this, right? It, it says like audiences that dismissed Gatsby's comedy the first time as a form of lecturing um, mm-hmm. didn't know how much she could lecture. Like, yeah, and then yeah. she gives us a lecture. Um, do you think we've moved decisively? Again, I'm using that term decisively as though we can't ever go back um, past this metric of like laughs per minute as the way that we measure comedy. Um, I mean, Nikki Glaser just recently talked on your podcast about how she's developing the skill of performing without a live studio audiences and kind of adjusting to it. So like, is that one way maybe that the pandemic is restructuring comedy that we don't maybe necessarily have to have laughs, a laugh track that kind of register um, to make sure that we know what we're supposed to be laughing at? Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, man, this book proposal I'm working on, this is all (laughs) in there. The thing that you getting at specifically is I wrote this piece after Nanette came out. I didn't write about Nanette. I actually wrote it after watching Amazon's t- this Amazon TV show called Forever, um, mm-hmm. which was Fred Armisen and Maya Rudolph started starred in a comedy written by like essentially all Parks and Rec like hard joke sitcom writers, and it was like the least funny TV show I've ever seen. But it was a comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a sitcom, but like no com. So it was just like this is just a situation, and. 
so that is what put me over the top. And so I was writing a piece that was just pointing out all these things. And then, and then I came up with this term called post comedy, um, which was very divisive at the time. This was 2017 or 2018, which essentially it's like comedy that's using the form of comedy, but, but without the traditional um, goals associated with that form. Right. So, um, right. And it's not anti-humor. That is, right. it's not, yeah. it's not anti-humor, right? It's not, it's not like this yeah. joke is bad and this, it's funny. That is still right, ultimately right. the structure of comedy and it's sure. not, not comedy. It's still mm-hmm. comedy because they are comedians and there is something comedic happening. Um, it's just that you're not trying to get laughs from it. And, and maybe, you know, like I haven't thought of the exact way of putting this analogy because it's like not exactly how, um, what is it? The ship of Croesus or the ship of Theseus? Ship of I'm gonna look it up. The, yeah, mm-hmm. the ship of Theseus. You know that um, philosophical mm-hmm. idea. So this is, and this is also like a double bastardization of it. But it's essentially like, let's say you had a ship, and then you replaced over time one element of that ship every day for like five years. So every single board was deliberately switched out. So that five years later, every single element is different than the first element, right? Is that ship the same ship as it was before? This is the, and, Mm. um, Mm. you know, and it's meant to be sort of a metaphor of for our our own identities. And are we the same persons we were, even if all of our cells have been traded out over the course of seven years? And so, but I think of it, or I'm trying to think of it, I have not really landed on, which is like, um, let's say you do a ship, and it was made up of laughs and silences, right? And if you remove all the laughs and it was all the silences, is it still comedy, right? Is it like if it's the same person doing the same thing, but instead of the parts where they're not la- where all the parts that are not laughter, that is the only part. There's only the non-laughter parts. Hypothetically, that still counts because all comedy sets include things where people laugh and things where people don't laugh. No one is literally having a person come on stage and they laugh truly nonstop <laughs> for 60 minutes. It's impossible. You don't go, mm-hmm. hello, they start laughing and then you do like dance. It just never ever has happened in the history of art and comedy mm-hmm. where someone came on stage and it's literally nonstop. So yeah, it's like a rhythmic inter- iterative kind of thing, yes, right? If yeah. it would, you, you burn the audience out. So let's say what's the opposite. So like, what if it's all silences, which you can achieve. Um, so, and, but the, the thing that makes it still comedy, and then that is a great example, which is, though you're not laughing, let's say, for the last 30 minutes, there is a fundamental irony about that show that is a comedic idea, which is, I'm going to tell you I'm quitting stand-up via stand-up. I'm going to say, right now, I'm not doing anymore, and you are going to keep on doing, like, that is, a. if you hear the idea, that is funny. People would make mm-hmm. fun of the show for that. Yeah, and I'm like, that, that, that yeah. is the idea. That is the comedic idea that it's pursuing. Now, are you laughing in the moment at that? You're not when she's telling you about these traumatic things. No, because you're, you're, you're in the moment. Yeah, but for sure. you leave being like, that is a comedic paradox that she posed. I'm stuck with that. I'm thinking about how that was funny. That is a comedic act. You're just not laughing at it. Right. So that mm-hmm. and that was what I wrote. It's called Post Comedy. And people really hated it. Um hmm. Two people, two groups of people hate it. There were these, um, because the term is so catchy, um, <laughs> a lot of like conservative, like really right wing lunatics jumped onto it and and kind of sub- changed what it meant. They obviously didn't read the piece and it was much more about, um, they felt post comedy meant like after comedy in so much as like, well, now that all comedy is, is like woke speeches by Seth Meyers comedy is over right and uh, uh and and that's what the problem is is that comedy is too woke and it's too issue oriented which is very stupid and i hate it i hated when he was so stupid ben shapiro did this big rant i'm like you're being so stupid for like the next 20 minutes talking about a thing incorrectly and it's it's actually how it's used most often people people just sort of say it but what seth myers which was ben shapiro's example is so frustrating because seth specifically is like not a fan of non-joke comedy more so than a lot of sort of political comedians, he's like, he came up with the term clapter, which is um, mm. jokes where you clap instead of laugh. Like he's really <laughs> against it. Um, yeah, yeah. 
And the other Conan people... Conan O'Brien used to make fun of that all the time, too. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. other people who reacted negatively against it were a certain sort of comedian. Um, uh, Chris D'Elia and Joe Rogan were sort of the most famous. And to be fair, they're two very famous people. Um, and they tweeted things that were sort of... They didn't. They clearly didn't read it, but they sort of pushed back upon it on mm-hmm. Twitter at the idea and they they obviously are two people that sort of represent a, a more traditional idea of what stand up should be um of like you go into the comedy club and you're making them laugh blah blah, blah. and um i understood that but the problem is if you don't read the piece you think that i'm arguing that comedy should have less laughs um and less fewer jokes and clearly that's like not my thing i have a podcast for jokes I like <laughs> jokes. I think jokes are a useful way of talking. And, and, and I think that jokes are a special thing. But mm-hmm. um, Mosher Kasher and I talked about this, which is certain comedians are so um, insecure about the fact that what they do is even an art form at all, that they become really defensive uh, against anyone who tries to do it a different way. And that's some some comedians. I think there's a large portion of for better for worse like what you would call a a club comedian and and it's not all club comedians it's just sort of people who for whatever reason are that's who they connect with um and and but they still believe themselves to be artists and that is i think a, a personal point of 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 pain for those people which is like they want to be taken seriously as an artist but they're seen as this one thing this one thing must be the way to do it but you know they push back upon it Mm-hmm. So, and then this sort of pandemic happened and forced people to sort of disconnect the relationship of between comedy and laughter because so much comedy was being made without laughter um, because it was over Zoom or you sort of don't hear it in the same way. You're performing for a bunch of cars and, you know, like what is happening? The rhythm is different, um, but you're still ex- you're still explaining comedic idea and and it has it i you know never will go back in so much as people will always realize this is a thing that happened Mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of people i think stand-ups who become a little bit addicted to that reaction will realize oh you know i think what nikki nikki really tashed uh tapped into is that like a lot of people start out because they want a certain reaction to their work and they need that reaction what motivates comedians to keep on working is this um you know this need to be rewarded this need to be heard this need to be understood this need this need for approval and that makes you keep on performing over and over again, which is what you need to do. It is really hard to do stand-up. It's really hard to start in stand-up. You need a bit of a, you need something to drive you to keep on doing it. For a lot of people, it is a, a need for approval. It's not for everybody. It's just a lot of people. But as you keep on doing it and you become more successful, you maybe have the ability to afford to go into therapy and you realize you, you can divorce your relationship from your work and the response to it. And then you become much more interested in the creation of work. You're like, I'm motivated in writing jokes. That is my passion. That is my joy. I love doing it. I also like want people to be happy. However, I do not need the part where they all laugh in my direction at one time. That intense feeling is not what motivates me anymore. Hmm. So for a person like Nikki, She's like, I'm creating this radio show in which I get to be funny, which is the thing that I enjoy most. It also makes people's lives better by being comedic for them. That is enough. She does not need to hear them laughing to know that she's doing her job of being funny. And like, and, and that is like ultimately the difference. Like we are now, people are having much more holistic ideas of what comedy is and how it relates in this relationship to laughter and, and and I think this will um, this time is really underlined that for people, and I think it's been really interesting for for me as well as a person who's always tried to analyze comedy divorced from what I laugh at. Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, so much to unpack in that answer. I think, you know, I wanted to pick up this idea of comedians needing approval, but then getting to a point where they can kind of reflect on that need for approval. I teach and I've, you know, it's taken me a long time to get to that point where I can um, think in terms of, you know, what my audience, a, a group of students gets out of the, you know, that exchange. And I, I just remember other teachers kind of being kind of grossed out by them talking about how they don't know what they would do if they didn't have like a weekly captive audience. Like, <laughs> it's not really what teaching is about. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, it's pretty, that's pretty narcissistic, but that's obviously to some extent, like part of why you do it. I mean, you want, you do kind of need to have that degree of narcissism perhaps, but then get to a point where that narcissism has kind of buoyed you along to a place where you're just exercising your creative muscles, maybe. So like, I think the other, uh, kind of experimentation that we're seeing in comedy is about kind of playing with the framing of the show itself, right? Like we, we've kind of gestured to this a few times, but like to just, you know, uh, be really clear about what I mean, like you've got Maria Bamford, especially playing with this idea um, by, you know, performing in a small room with their relatives or out on the street. Drew Michaels HBO special is often cited as this kind of um, as a touchstone in this kind of experimentation with framing. Gerard Carmichael really kind of tried to rethink how jokes are delivered in extreme close up with no mm -hmm. audience, that kind of stuff. Jenny Slate, I thought, stage fright um, in incorporating so many documentary elements, um, did a lot of this kind of experimental work. Um, the overall effect, according to people like Drew Michael, is to really put the idea of authenticity in question, like, yeah. in a sense, to, you know, underscore the fact that comedy is always performative. And I know, you know, Catherine um, Van Arendonk wrote an, a review of Stage Fright for Vulture, and she makes this great point that messing with the framing tends to collapse the distance between performer and audience. Do you think this is just about keeping comedy fresh or is there something more profound happening with the presentation of comedy? And, you know, do you think that there's any limit to the kind of experimentation that we're going to see? Um, you know, you, you have a kind of bias toward this experimentation. So I'm wondering whether you just you have a hunger for more of that kind of stuff or if you maybe miss certain conventions that are now seen as maybe uncool or mm -hmm. old fashioned with the rise of these more experimental well, uh, pieces. I will say I don't miss anything because there's still tons of that. Like, you know, right. the whatever we think of as the traditional thing is is not going away because most people I mean, want. Yeah. <laughs> Bamford's, know, like, Bamford's new special, right? Yeah, it was it's like, you know, she looked, I mean, though she did look at the camera, she acknowledged that the camera existed, which sure. is still different, but that's, you're never going to be able to push, put her in a box. She'll just be like, you know, mm -hmm. it's just sort of how it goes. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything more profound. You know, it. If I, I wish I had something at my disposal. I'm just like, oh, this is all about the new blah, blah, blah. And I had some <laughs> um, word. And I'm trying to think if there is anything more profound about it. I mean, like, other than... I, I, th I think there's a couple things that I think. I think it's a... There was a the, this sort of autobiography movement where sort of like honesty of a certain sort was being rewarded. Um, in stand-up. Louis was sort of the one who's most identified with it, um, despite the fact that he was lying about a lot of things or withholding a lot of truth. But he was a sort of associated with a sort of idea of radical honesty, regardless of if he was doing it or not. And there's a lot of comedians who followed through with that idea. And then, partly because, it's not just because Louis then was revealed to sort of be hiding on all these things, that people started questioning the honesty because people were doing this before him, right? So it's like, like Bo Burnham special, which was very much sort of going after truth in a different way, was very much pushing back against that. And I, I think there is a bit of pushing back against the previous generation's understanding of like what the form should be and like what honest is and like, and so for a lot of comedians now, that means acknowledging that this is fake. I think you, there's just so many examples. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little as Chelsea Peretti doing cutaways to people that aren't actually in the audience. It's like clowns or whatever. I mean, the, the, the thing that I first think of is like Kristen Schaal for months talked about how her special went poorly, mm -hmm. you know, and then it, it went poorly clearly on purpose, but like kind of not on purpose, but either way, it was really honest to like a person's way of ex 
showing this thing and being yeah, like, the way and, she frames her final joke, right? Yeah. yeah and, and yeah. so like, there's all these formalists and the thing about a lot of the ones we've mentioned is they're all very famous, successful television stars. Like a lot of them are like, have the clout to do stuff like this. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. um, where there are other experimental people who exist, who sort of are not given the leeway to sort of push back on form. Um, so it's partly just comedy evolving and the many ways in which comedy evolves when people can think of comedy as a, as a visual medium where when you go and you have comedians, when you get to a certain level that you're expecting to do multiple specials, that is not a thing that has existed for any generation of comedy before this current generation. So you don't have to think of you're creating a film piece. You think of you're like, I'm doing, I'm, I'm just need to get through these gigs. Oh, I get to film it. Here's the thing. Mm-hmm. But now you're getting like, Oh, I'm going to be creating a visual thing. What is the idea that I'm trying to express? I'm going to, this is going to exist. How can I go about creating this hour that will make sense for the idea that I want to express when I film it? And and so when you have people that are thinking of it like that, then it becomes much more of a director's point of view. It becomes much more about an idea point of view of like, what is this whole thing going to express? And it could be just thematic, right? Or tonal or subject matter wise. I'm going to do a special just about this. Or it can be, I'm going to talk about whatever but the sort of visual language I'm going to express is going to be about something else. And it's going to be about authenticity or, or breaking down the fourth wall or, or, or whatever. I mean, like, so I think it, it, it's a bit of that, right? I think mm-hmm. it's also, this is, this is not, I'm not one to do these types of theories and I, I haven't really thought, about, thought it out. So I apologize ahead of time. But I do think, you know, most of the comedians we're talking about are generally of my generation, I would say, in so much as some are a little bit younger, some are a little bit older, but they all are sort of like either young Gen X or older millennial. And we are the generation that has had to reckon with the internet. Um, so where older generations, the internet never really became a big part of their lives in the same way because they already had full adult lives and then the internet came and then they just sort of adjusted whatever to that. And younger generations grew up with the internet. So that's the only reality they knew. We are the sort of matrix. We're the kids that saw the matrix in high school or in college and were like, what is real and what isn't real? This internet thing feels not exactly like the world we had before it. So I think there's a bit of like reckoning with reality that this group of people is doing even either intentionally or not, or, or, I mean, the other thing is I'm actually now buying this idea. I've now made it up, but I'm like, Oh, that's, I want to convince yourself. But the other thing is I asked the Lucas brothers about um, existentialism. There's all this new, you know, all this new existentialist comedy and, you know, like famously existentialism um, in art came out of after world war two. And, And so I asked them about it and they're like, you know, 9-11, right? So I I think um, is what they said was sort of the reason. And I I think that's also part of it, right? So 9-11 happens, this traumatic event. And for people of specifically my age demo, I think it was a, a more acute trauma in terms of not it was disorienting about like what reality is and, and in the way that a thing like that can happen. And I, and I think you're seeing that being processed as well. It's just sort of that feeling of, you know, it's why the idea like is everything assimilation is much more popular right now. It's just sort of there, this feeling like this can't be right. This can't be real life. And I think Older people are cynic, more cynical to it, being like, hey, this is life, it sucks, there's these bad things. And younger people had their own sort of cynicism and that you'll see where they're like, this is just what it is. We've only known this. But I think that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a lot of people in the, around the same era reckoning with a thing in a similar way, also being influenced by each other. You know, a lot of these people are working together or are friends with each other or see what's possible. Also, like, the thing that is preventing there from being more 
is always going to be industry interest. You know, the people, the, the amount of people that get to approve stand up specials and stand up special budgets is pretty small. It's like, you know, five people, hmm. you know, like at least in the States. I, I have no sense of like other places, but like to do the type of specials we're talking about demands more money. It means you're hiring a director and maybe the director is working longer. You you are doing shoots. You're doing like um, reshoots and stuff like that. You know, like Bo Burnham shot part of his special without the audience because you want to get certain shots you can't get with an audience. You know, it's all these little yeah. things cost money. The thing that's cheap is just like you have one camera set up and you have 10 people use the same camera set up and maybe you change the set. Like that's what Comedy Central is doing for years. Right. So industry interest is what will really drive it. <laughs> um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And it's whether there's a market, an audience yeah. for that kind of experimentation. Because people are, because people have been experimenting forever. Like it's a form that people go on stage and they talk and mm -hmm. that can attract people who are doing regular stuff and it could attract people who are unusual and stand up is the most famous way of getting to do whatever you want on stage. So there's always going to be an inclination to push boundaries. It's just a matter of like how much we get to see of it. Yeah. And I, that's why, you know, I appreciate that people like Gerard Car Carmichael um, have, have now really established themselves as distinctive voices in comedy because, you know, the stuff he produces just stands out aesthetically from other specials. And I, I definitely appreciate that. Like you've, you've talked about how his, his direction in uh, Lil Rel, Howry's Live in Crenshaw is is the best marriage of directing and comedy you've ever seen. But as you point out, like that requires resources. That special, which looks absolutely beautiful um, and also very simple in some ways, was nonetheless a, a feat of production. Like yes. to use the golden hour in the way that they did um, takes planning and, and resources. Um, and actually, you know, when I mentioned I was interviewing you to a few friends, they were blown away by the fact that you've been able to talk comedy with all these people, John Mulaney, Jerry Seinfeld. And like, I like Mulaney a lot, but I was most excited to see that you talked to uh, Lil Rel Howery and, and, and the Lucas Brothers and, and people that, you know, are, are perhaps a little bit, I don't know about underground, but a little bit, you know, uh, offbeat to some extent. Mm. Um, so and, you know, like so many things you talked about there, how 9-11, you know, blow, blew up certain myths around, I think, basically American exceptionalism and, and gave rise to a certain kind of cynicism about, I think, the United States place in the world yeah. in some way. Um, you know, there, there needed to be a different kind of conversation after that event. Um, and alongside that event, in some, or, or uh, you know, a few years later, you see the rise of podcasting, um, which allows you to be less structured, less formal, let's, you know, but equally as pointed as, you know, like a TV interview in some ways, you know, we haven't really talked about podcasting in particular. Um, and, and, you know, it just seems to me that uh, it's, it's having this moment, like Conan was featured in a variety article marking the rise of comedic podcasting. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of like uh, the AV club, you know, posted an article saying like, this is, this is completely off base. Like there are people who are the progenitors of this genre that aren't getting their due. Um, I thought that was an interesting moment. We're, we're at this kind of, you know, this pivotal place where podcasting has clearly changed comedy and in a real sense, comedy has shaped podcasting. Um, to some extent, that means that a certain boom is over as Nikki Glaser has put it. Um, but do you feel that like, that is the case that like going live on Instagram means the end of a boom or the the kind of disappearance of certain gatekeepers. I mean, you mentioned there are four or five people who approve comedy specials, so there are still gatekeepers. Mm. Um, is there more to lament about this moment? Is Does the end of the boom basically expand the possibilities for comedy in sure. some sense? So which yeah. boom are you, what is the boom you're thinking of? The podcast boom or a comedy boom? I'm thinking more in terms of the, the comedy boom, right? Like sure. where they were just, I think they say in Swingers, they're just handing sitcoms out to com yeah, comedians yeah, 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 at the yeah. airport or whatever, yeah. I will say this. I don't, I um, have recently decided I don't believe in comedy booms. Um, hmm. I don't believe it as an idea. I think what we've called comedy booms has been a period in which the popularity of comedy has been focused in on a specific medium in a way that was clear to 
the industry of how to make money off of it. So the sort of previous comedy booms were the, the sort of 19, late 1950s, 1960s comedy record boom, um, which was, they called it, some people called it a comedy boom. Most people don't even like think about it, but essentially the late 1950s and 1960s recording technology was to a point where you can do these long play albums and people were looking for things to put on it. They put some comedy on it. It became incredibly successful. So much so that comedy got its own Grammy category for the first time. And there were these huge records, right? Um, the, the most famous example and the most extreme example is sort of Bob Newhart's first album, the button up the comedy of button, Bob Newhart was so successful. It was like the number one album in the country. It in that year's Grammys, it was, it did not win best comedy record Grammy because it won the best album Grammy. The album oh, that man. did win the best comedy album Grammy was Bob Newhart's other album. So, and then, oh, and then sort of, so like it was a, they were putting out so many of these records. Everyone was getting a comedy record. It was a way to sort of make money. And it ended in about like 1969. I can't remember why it just sort of did. Um, and that was seen as a boom because it was clear it was that, and then it was over. Right. And then you said the 19, and then you have the 1980s, which was sort of the comedy club boom. Um, they call it the comedy boom, but you know, and, and the idea was like, there's comedy clubs point, popping up everywhere. People can have all these careers touring around the country and it created sort of the infrastructure we still live with today of like how comedy touring works. And then uh, around 1990 or so there was a recession, a lot of, a lot of clubs closed. Um, like one quarter of the comedy clubs in America closed and people said the comedy boom is dead. Um, uh, ironically, that is also when a lot of things were happening in comedy in both these times, right? So the comedy record album, the comedy album boom dies in, by 1970. By 1970, you're now going to see the rise of like Steve Martin and Richard Pryor and George Carlin, three people who are like by far the most successful comedians you can ever imagine. Like the size of Steve Martin's existence is, you know. Yeah. And, and then you see the opening of essentially the creation of comedy clubs. Now, during this time, there was less money being made, but not less comedy being consumed. We just decided it's not a boom because less money was being made by the industry writ large. But a lot of people were making money and also a lot of people were like developing themselves. Um, same thing happens in the 1990s, right? So the comedy clubs are closing. But like all the TV shows we're thinking of, almost all of them come about in the 90s. You're seeing so much comedy on TV. Comedy Central starts in the 90s. Def Jam starts in the 90s. You know, like, there's so much comedy in the 90s, this period that is considered the, this fallow time in the history of comedy is supposed to be our sort of comedy bust moment. It does, you know, it doesn't make sense. So mm. what happened in 2010, the same thing happens, right? So it's like, oh, there's all these podcasts and, you know, other sort of new media writ large. And we're like, that's a comedy boom. And there's all these people still touring and that's also part of it. But like ultimately, what it really is is just like all the other periods. It's just sort of um, we only had an idea that comedy exists in boom and bust cycles. But for the most part, comedy always has an amount of popularity because people like comedy generally. It's just sort of like right now there are a lot of different ways in which people could have careers doing it, and that is not ended because of this because of the pandemic. Like. A lot of comedians are still making a lot of money, a lot, a lot. There's maybe few and they're making tons because things are not being filmed and you can't tour. But like all these podcasts still have audiences. There's all these Patreons. People are going live on Instagram and becoming influencers, There's sort of a zillion ways. And I think it's partly just sort of accepting. My thing is like, let's just accept that like comedy is a renewable resource. Comedy is an art form, at least in this country and maybe others. I can't really speak for it because I do not live there. But a art form of the level of TV, movies, and music, um, it is treated like not on the level, you know, like I always point out that like major publications will have a TV, more than one TV critic, more than one film critic, more than one music critic. Um, many will have architecture critics, they'll have art critics, if not more than one art critics, they'll have dance critics, you know, they'll have food critics. Comedy has arguably zero full-time 
critics and major institutions. Jason is not full-time, I believe. I'm not a full-time critic. That's not how I view myself. Catherine, who writes criticism for us, she also writes about TV. That, mm-hmm. You know, like, that is a distinction. Like, it does not have this long t- period of time where we've taken it seriously. That is sort of my goal, is sort of, like, raise it up and make sure it stays up. So, like, to answer your question, I don't think a boom is ending. I don't think podcasting is, is ending. I think, if anything, th- you know, the industry is figuring out really how to monetize itself. You know, I've, I've, I've had friends who were in the first wave of the comedy podcast industry who like did not know how they'd make money. And I think that's ending. Um, I just think more attention is going to be paid to celebrities, which is always the case, but that doesn't mean anything's ending. I mean, like the Doughboys, to use an example, is like a podcast that like gets no attention to mainstream media, but has hundreds of thousands of listeners and has a Patreon that has like, I think I saw like 8,000 subscribers or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, Um, it's hard for me to be like, oh, there's a bust or that Conan O'Brien is the only podcaster alive. I just think it's like, you know, comedians get jealous or grumpy that other people get the attention, but like, that's always going to be the case. But like, I think we built this thing to last. I think like how comedy has, how comedy rebuilt itself from 1990 on is more sustainable than it's ever been. Yeah. I mean, the so-called long tail phenomenon, right? Like you've got maybe less of a monolithic concentration in the media, but that allows for more people to be involved. And I, I like, you know, I, I, I realize um, I've taken enough of your time and, and that's actually like a pretty great place to end. You've, I can't wait to, you know, read your book because <laughs> it's clear that you have like this comprehensive understanding of like the historical progression of comedy in some sense. And also this kind of theory of of you know boom and bust as this kind of super imposition of mm. an economic logic on something that is really profoundly cultural and political like and those things are always contaminated to some extent by commerce because people have to make money yes. but like you're saying that these that that imposition of a certain logic actually skews our understanding of what comedy is for like the kind of enduring appeal of comedy which i think is um very true i mean um, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, so I just really want to thank you for giving me this, like this opportunity to talk to you and, and especially at a time where I think like, um, given how shitty 2020 has mm-hmm. been, how desperately we need funny people now, like, um, and, and need to take seriously the contribution that they, that they make. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I will say, say this, which is like, that's the thing that I, that I go back to. And when, if I ever, you know get to write this book the point of this book is not all these ideas that i shared but the point of this book is that i like comedy a lot i think i get more enjoyment out of a bit than anyone uh there is i don't just because i can enjoy all types of comedy in a way that i think a lot of people have a hard time doing people can only enjoy the comedy that they immediately react to i can enjoy comedy that i don't laugh at but i get i'm interested in all of it i get a reaction from all of it and it's been profound to my life. It's the longest relationship I had. It's, it is, I've had, you know, tra- tragic moments in my, my childhood and my adulthood that it has helped me out of um, because it's sort of undeniable. Like when you laugh, you can't stop yourself. It is, it is a weird glitch of our evolution, but for, the, for whatever reason, we've had this thing where you sometimes can't stop yourself from laughing. And that is like, a that is, truly like light and darkness shit you know it, mm-hmm. it's like and if i can help people get have a relationship like mine i i think that is profound and and i and that is like ultimately as i've evolved as a, a writer and a thinker or as a podcast or whatever about comedy that has become the goal which is just sort of like i have this thing that i get what i think of an extraordinary amount of joy out of or extraordinary amount of meeting out of and I think existence is a very hard thing that we do not choose to have that if I can give people some sort of guidance of how to get as much out of a thing as I do, you know, that, that is meaningful to me. I think, you know, if they think that I'm right or wrong about jokes or whatever, that, that is sort of secondary, but I, you know, I want people to laugh. I want them to laugh at more things than they've been able to laugh at the laugh at comedians that they thought they didn't like, you know, like, I don't think it means like, blanketly accepting all comedy as like good or ethical or whatever at minimum like every comedian is a is formed by their audience so if you see a comedian who's famous and you're not laughing 
at minimum think of it anthropologically it's like oh this is a thing that like thousands this is a joke that thousands of people responded to why It, it is sort of endlessly fascinating at least i hope it's endless it's been fascinating in so much of my entire life but yeah i think you know this has been not a very challenging year but like comedy is a sort of in many ways, it's sort of a, as a tension relief valve was created for things like this. Absolutely. You know, this idea that there is value in levity, mm-hmm. that levity is a form of enlightenment almost, that we get too self-obsessed. Uh, anyway, so thank you so much, Jesse. Um, oh, no and, problem. Uh, thank you for having me. This was, you know, you know, it's useful at this point. I'm just like, me, <laughs> if I'm ever going to do this thing, I need to like practice like thinking out loud. So Mm -hmm. um, this is very useful. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much.